Thank you, everyone, for finding a seat so we can get started. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed a pleasant lunch. Uh, thank you for coming back to join us for this graduate student lightning round. A bit of explanation. As part of the grant that has made possible this five parts Terra Symposia series on American art in a global context, travel support was, made was provided by the foundation to one graduate student of each non-US presenter. So over the past nine years, students from Canada, China, England, France, Ireland, Japan, Mexico, Nigeria, South Africa, and Switzerland have come to hear lectures and participate in the symposia events. This year, rather than having them listen to the talks, we decided it would be better to also hear from these students to see what the next generation of art historians is working on, and so we asked each to give a five-minute lecture about a single image that relates to their thesis or dissertation. It's a challenging format, but one that we hoped would allow us to showcase a variety of emerging research and stimulate dialogue between and about projects. Um, we also invited one of our Terra pre-doctoral fellows to participate. I am really grateful to all our graduate student pr participants for so graciously accepting this challenge and look forward to hearing a little bit more about their projects in the presentations and perhaps even more so in the discussion afterwards. So I'll start by introducing our first speaker. Emily Casey is a doctoral candidate in the history of art at the University of Delaware. Her dissertation, Waterscapes, Representing the Sea in the American Imagination, 1760 to 1815, explores how 18th century British Americans visualized their place in a global world through representations of the sea in art, literature, and material culture. Emily has received numerous grants and fellowships to support her research from the University of Delaware, the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the Peabody Essex Museum, and the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, London. She is the 2015-16 Terra Foundation Predoctoral Fellow at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Emily received her BA from Smith College, and in addition to her research, she has worked at the Smith College Museum of Art, Winterthur Museum, and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. Please welcome Emily Casey.
Thank you, Amelia. Um, we are going to launch from shifting terrain into the sea, the realm of the sea. My dissertation considers how Americans imagined the sea in the last quarter of the 18th century by examining a broad range of late colonial and early national art and material culture. I sniff out the salty sea air and listen for the slap and shush of ocean waves in maps and paintings, punch bowls and prints. I ask how the sea was materially conjured in the textures and forms of these objects. What kind of associations did the sea have for the Americans that touched and owned these things? My inquiry is at its most exciting when it leads me to objects that at first glance seem to be far removed from fluid ocean currents. Today, I have chosen just such a work, a canonical portrait of the Washington family by Edward Savage from the 1790s in the collection of the National Gallery of Art. Set at George Washington's plantation of Mount Vernon, the first president is joined by his wife, Martha, and children. Spread upon the table is a map of the new capital, Washington City. The painting celebrates the transformation of a war hero into a political leader and of a swampy wilderness into civic order. However, at the margins of the painting, a blank globe and the figure of an enslaved man emerge and to my eyes, another story. Savage's unusual depiction of the globe de-emphasizes land masses with sketchy, barely visible strokes, creating an unsettling vision of vast, undifferentiated oceanic space. The African-American's ambivalent inclusion as both servant and observer highlights the staged nature of the family portrait. The enslaved figure and the globe frame the painting's narrative troubling the empirical status of the map at its center by drawing oceanic spaces and the economy of the slave trade into the city's broad and ordered streets. Other representations of water in the painting, the Potomac River on the map, and a generalized view of ships on a river outside the window, further challenge the painting's vision of a national entity grounded on solid American terrain. Map, slave, globe, waterscape. These four features act as touchstones for my exploration of how the traversals and imaginings of oceanic space were made visible and meaningful through material representation. With its prominent representation of the Potomac snaking across the corner of the page, the map at the painting center points to the importance of cartography in visualizing the maritime space of America. The first chapter of my dissertation considers how British imperial hydrographic charts navigate the physical and metaphoric distance between the Americas and Europe. Published during the tumultuous years of the Seven Years' War and War of Independence, these charts show the persistent visual association of the Americas with the coast and the sea, despite the changing contours and names of political territories. The presence of the enslaved figure, believed to be Christopher Shields, reminds me that for Americans of all backgrounds, the transatlantic slave trade was one of the primary associations with oceanic space. Inspired by his visibility within this work, my second chapter seeks to understand how representations of the sea and early Republic painting upended triumphalist narratives of American identity and power by revealing the violence and uncertainty of an 18th century global world. The globe in the corner suggests the symbolic work of decorative art objects in early national homes. My third chapter follows the transit of a porcelain punch bowl from the Chinese harbor of Canton across the Indian and Atlantic oceans and into a US parlor. Through the material culture of foreign trade, substances from beyond the United States, including Chinese porcelain or the international ingredients that made up punch, alternately fashioned and challenged the identities of their American consumers. Finally, my eye is drawn down the course of the river outside the window. Through this waterscape, I contemplate those spaces where land and sea meet in particular, harbors and coastlines. 
My last chapter examines engraved views of cities in which harbors are depicted as destination and point of departure. How does this print culture infuse the American national landscape with a maritime sensibility, connecting far distant places through a constellation of waterways? As I have shown, my prolonged study of Savage's portrait has suggested a diverse array of objects and numerous avenues of inquiry which guide my dissertation. It also prompts new ways of seeing the painting itself. On a recent visit to Washington and his family at the NGA, I became absorbed by Martha's dress. The shimmer and gleam of its silvery gray fabric seems to me to enlarge the liquid world suggested on the globe. Even the ruffles of her lace evoke the foam caps of waves, inserting fluid currents into the seemingly stable picture. My wishy-washy notions set this painting at sea and prompt me to consider what exactly it means to mobilize US identity. When we begin shifting terrain, literally moving away from national land to the far less stable empire of the sea, what will come to the surface? Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Otto, a PhD candidate in art history at the University of Montreal, where she is currently working on her dissertation, Art Histories of Unlearning, Emily Carr, and Gabriel Munter. After finishing her MA in business economics, Otto studied art history, archaeology, and philosophy in Regensburg, Munich, and Montreal. In the first year of her PhD, Otto was a fellow in Canadian art at the National Ga Gallery of Canada, Ottawa. Since 2014, she's been a teaching assistant in the University of Montreal's Department of Art History and a research assistant in the Department of Contempor um, Comparative Literature in collaboration with the Warburg Institute in London. Besides her research on women artists and 20th century primitivism, she's interested in the interrelations between European and North American art and art histories, in particular, the mobility of artists, scholars, and aesthetic concepts in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Please welcome Elizabeth Otto. I kind of knew that um, this trip, my first one to Washington, um, would be a remarkable one when I already had a, a lengthy chat uh, with a US American officer at the, the customs of the um, airport of Montreal about Mark Toby and American <laughs> art history. And that is no joke. But in fact, it exceeded all my expectations and that thanks to the Terra Foundation and the extraordinary work of Amelia Gerlitz. And I'm very pleased uh, to talk to you today about Mark Toby and Emily Carr. In the fall of 1928, uh, Mark Toby taught a master class in the studio of Canadian painter Emily Carr in Victoria, British Columbia. On this occasion, he also painted a still life of Carr's studio in which an eclectic mass of objects radiates around a female bust. Fragments of picture frames, Northwest Coast native artifacts, objects from Carr's basket collection and her pottery dishes with native designs are piled up and seen from conflicting viewpoints. Painted in the didactic aim of demonstrating the Cubist method to Emily Carr and other attendees of the three-week three class, the painting is also significant in the way it comments on specific realities of the Northwest Coast, with its abundant nature and rich native culture, and how they could be reflected in the medium of painting. Roughly 30 years later, by which time Toby had already secured his national reputation as the founding father of the Northwest School, he would claim that he had only gone from Seattle to Victoria to help Carr out. His still life, however, clearly testifies to the fact that he recognized in this woman painter, 19 years his senior, an artist who had developed a modernist language by responding to the needs of her homeland, the Northwest Coast. In 1927, Emily Carr had just participated in the pivotal exhibition of Canadian West Coast art, native and modern, at the National Gallery of Canada, and had been declared, together with the members of the Eastern Canadian Group of Seven, the most important representative of Canadian modernist landscape painting. 
Featuring an exhibition as the only artist from the West Coast, Carr was answering Canada's need for a modern national art history that stretched from coast to coast. Born in 1871 in Victoria to British parents, she had followed the trajectory of many women artists of her generation by seeking artistic training in private art schools in San Francisco, London, and finally in Paris in 1910, all the while teaching on the side. Over these years, she had developed a singular artistic project to paint all the remaining totem poles of the province west coast. When her artistic project got rejected by public sponsors as well as private collectors, Carr had stopped painting almost entirely and had earned her living by renting out rooms, breeding dogs and producing rugs and pottery in what she called Indian design. Finally, in the summer of 1928, encouraged by public recognition and financed by private sponsors, she had left again for a sketching trip up north, painting native sites. Upon her return, Mark Toby's teachings helped her to turn the field sketches she had brought home with her into minimal paintings that could evoke the effective qualities she had found in the expressive First Nations carvings, which made strong talk for her, as she called it. Indeed, it was arguably under Mark Toby's guidance that she discovered how to achieve the carvings directness through the modeling of mass and volume. BC scholar Gertrude Mori has offered the most important analysis of Emily Carr's studio. In her book, Unsettling Encounters, First Nations Imagery in the Art of Emily Carr, she reads Toby's painting as an allegorical portrait of Carr that evokes the artist's sense of mission. On Mori's account, the studio figures as a subjective pictorial space representing Carr's career. For example, she argues that the female bust in the center is in fact a life cast of Carr's head that hung on her studio wall. While I subscribe to her analysis, I believe the painting should be considered first and foremost as a reflection of Toby's own artistic agenda as a painter of the West Coast subjects. In 1928, Mark Toby had just returned from extensive traveling in Europe and the Near East, which had included a long stay in Paris, where he studied interwar Cubism as well as earlier Cubist styles like that of Picasso. While still living in New York, he had already been introduced to European art movements at events such as the Armory Show in 1913. When he arrived in Seattle in the early 1920s to teach at the Cornish School of Art, he became friends with a group of painters who were all working the style of the School of Paris. Already then, he had met Emily Carr, having stayed at her house in Victoria, like several other Seattle artists, on sketching holidays. But he did not work with her then. I argue that Mark Toby needed first to live his own modern moment before he could appreciate Emily Carr's modernist primitivist project. This paper aims to show that Emily Carr's studio testifies not only to shared avant-garde sensibilities between Mark Toby and Emily Carr, but also to a common regional artistic consciousness, as for example about Northwest Coast Native artifacts both artists collected. North American modernism is therefore, I argue, literally informed by the territory. This approach does not neglect distinct national art histories, but wants to unlearn them, as I call it in my dissertation, and that by tying them back to their local and regional conditions, as for example, pre-existing cultures, traditions, and artifacts that inform the work of modernist artists and ultimately change their artistic practices altogether. Thank you very much. Davide Nerini is a first-year PhD student at the University of Lausanne's Center of the History of Culture, where he investigates the interactions between photography and the field of library and information science during the first half of the 20th century. His dissertation is part of a broader collaborative research project entitled Encapsulating World Culture, the Rise and Imaginary of Microfilm, 1920s to 1950s, which focuses on the understanding of photography as a medium of diffusion of visual and textual information. After earning a bachelor's in film studies from the Free University of Berlin and the University of Lausanne, Nerini received his master's degree in art history from the University of Lausanne in 2014, where he wrote his thesis on the work of art historian, librarian, and photographer Paul Vanderbilt. 
During the same year, he worked as a research fellow at the Swiss Institute for Art Research based in Zurich and Lausanne. And today he will tell us a little bit more about Vanderbilt. Thank you, uh, Amelia. In the early 1940s, a staff of such famous photographers as Walker Evans, Dorothea Lange, or Russell Lee, had accumulated a quarter million photographs under the sponsorship of a New Deal's agency called the Farm Security Administration. Yet, despite their valuable work, drastic cuts in the agency budget meant the photographic activities were soon terminated. However, before leaving office in October 1943, photographer's director, Roy Stryker, had one last important thing that, that needed attending to. The photographic file, a legacy of eight years' work, had to be preserved. It had to be preserved not only as a priceless cultural heritage, but also, I quote, as an active record and a historical tool of unparalleled importance. Stryker proposed that the FSA file be transferred to the Library of Congress. There, he said, the photographs will be, will be entirely in the public domain as a permanent archival collection, and thus accessible to anyone who wanted to use them. The plan was indeed a good one. Archibald MacLeish, at the time a librarian of Congress, was entirely reorganizing the library for the first time since its foundation in the 19th century. A concrete step was being taken toward the creation of a national archives of American photographs. Now, all that remained, after convincing various committees, was assigning the project to the right person. Stryker and McLeish considered Paul Vanderbilt, young art historian, librarian photographer, to be this person. Age of, age of 36, his curriculum vitae was already quite impressive. It shows him taking up bold projects for the Philadelphia Art Museum, sitting on international committees, and writing a recommendation, including one for Archibald MacLeish himself, to lay, how, to lay out how the cultural resources of the world might be made available thanks to an extensive microfilming program. Vanderbilt was then developing what he called a theory of total documentation, the purpose of which was to find new ways of dealing with the totality of recorded knowledge. In an unpublished book on bibliotechnics and photography, Vanderbilt wrote that the supply of knowledge may roughly be compared to the supply of water. Using this rather interesting knowledge as water metaphor, Vanderbilt suggests that the supply of images be a vital requirement as the supply of water is. More than that, in his view, the circulation of images would have deserved the same network of services and infrastructures as the one long established for the control of water resources. According to his, his theory of total documentation, then, the FSA file, I am quoting him once more, the FSA file must be seen as the potential part of a worldwide network of centers of documentation. But how would the masses of FSA photographs be possibly turned into such a worldwide network of centers of documentation? The well-known series of photographs that I'm showing you uh, on my slide is a glimpse to, to what Vanderbilt's solution looked like. Together with thousands of others, these nine photographs by Walker Evans were curated by Vanderbilt into a linear, if not narrative, sequence, and finally reproduced on microfilm. There is, of course, a considerable loss of image quality because of the microfilming process. However, the quality loss was entirely acceptable for Vanderbilt, since these microfilms were intended not as substitutes, but rather as visual references to the original material. In other words, anyone in possession of a set of these microfilms, would have been able to review the FSA photographs anywhere and at any time. This case study is an essential element in my PhD project on the interactions between photography, iconographic archives, and the field of information sciences. I would like then to conclude my presentation with the following. 
according to Hans Belting, the what's arising when we look at pictures cannot be understood without the hows, without some understanding of the visual strategies by which the what's are carried out. My question then is, how far are practices, ideas and debates about new information technologies changing and shaping the ways in which historians attempt to make sense of their sources? Thank you. Elie Armand Azoulay, born in 1987 in Paris, studied history and philosophy at Tel Aviv University and is currently completing her master's in research and exhibition studies at the University of Arts London, Central St. Martin. Since 2009, she's been an art correspondent for Haaretz newspaper and a freelance writer for various art magazines and publications, including Art Press, Flash Art, Aperture, Camera Austria, and Art Slant. At present, she's working on a research project concerning decolonizing practices in the public sphere with an artistic and cultural context. She is currently based out of Paris and recently published Local Wind, a collection of essays about catalogs and books published by Israeli artists in the 1970s and 80s. In September 2015, she began a research curatorial and production internship at the Beton Salon Center for Art and Research in Paris. Please welcome Ali. Hello, thank you uh, again for this invitation uh, to the Terra Foundation, the Sam and Amelia, of course. Um, I would like to um, start with this picture as a point of departure for my talk. So I will let you a minute to linger, and then I will move on. Um, what's wrong with this picture? The title of this talk is taken from the title of a show Edith Gregor Halpert organized for a downtown gallery in 1941. This blunt title, outwardly aimed at the public, but intended mostly for collectors, museum directors, and curators, basically asked what made a group of seven celebrated artworks so unsellable. Um, Basically, it's been uh, works that have been like 10 years old and had been celebrated because they've been uh, exhibited in various museum shows and been reproduced in magazines and many other publications. Um, so this is a, a painting by Peter Bloom, south of Scranton, and this is Charles Schiller, Americana, both from the beginning of the 1930s. Um, so here are two examples from the exhibition. Halpert's provocative question was elaborated upon in the show's accompanying press release. She also handed out questionnaires to the visitors, inviting them to participate in the conversation and share their thoughts on this matter. In accordance to that, I would like to show this photo that I showed at the beginning from 1926, from the opening exhibition of our gallery, as it was first called in 1926. From this photograph, I propose to read the model for a commercial gallery of the time. Galleries were conceived in relation to domestic space and scale, and so was the manner of exhibition making in terms of organization, display, and audience. This was the building of the downtown gallery in 1944, so it's one of, the, um, one of the places she was having her gallery. I would like you to think about this in relation to MoMA's old building, which you can see here. This model correspond with and defined by the interior design, such as the fireplace, the furniture, and other organizational and decorative components. For this display, Halpert installed modern and folk art, oil painting, and sculptures, all fitted to the size of the room, integrating with the furniture. This is another example from the American Folk Art Gallery. She opened in 1931 in the, second, in the second floor of the downtown gallery. It was before the establishment of the White Cube as the standard and accurate space to exhibit works of art. 
Nevertheless, Halpert never believed that any space is sufficient on its own, but it should be thought and remodeled accord according to our current understanding of the best conditions of display, the artworks, and moreover, to make them attractive to potential and diverse buyers. Her gallery had moved several times along the years, and each time it was accompanied with completely new ideology regarding the design, display, and accessibility, all in accordance with shaping the experience of the evolving art collector and spectators. Similarly, as museum investment in the past 10 or 15 years studying the spectator's behavior and taste and readdressing different potential of their findings, Edith Halpert pursued such a research but on her own. She was constantly reading and studying statistics and research, result, and, and research results that extended the art community and market and extracted meaning on the wider public. She always believed strongly that each and every one could and should become art collectors. She believed art, as any other commodities, could appeal to the local firemen as well as to the wealthy millionaire. Art for the 13 million would be the perfect example of these attempts. Based on the release of statistics, the 13 million Americans were buying all sorts of commodities from televisions, kitchen equipment, and cars using the installment plan. She mounted a show with a, with a wide range of pricing, similar to the various commodities mentioned above, and offered the buyers to pay them in installment throughout the year. At the same time, Halpert <clears throat> was looking towards other sectors at potential buyers, companies, directors, all interested in establishing art collection to bolster the public appearance. In 1953, she dedicated a room in the gallery for the Art of the Office exhibition. This persistent and uncompromising approach of introducing art to a wider public and caring, and caring for its right marketing and the various initiatives presented here today were not merely an aggressive marketing approach, though she was a relentless saleswoman. Halpert was acting out, refusing to accept given power relationships such as curator versus dealer, director versus curator, and etc. Or the influence or market-driven critical or personal taste. In the question, what's wrong with this picture, an opposite question is also implied. What's right with this picture? This supposition undermines the epistemological and determined terminological basis of for the authoritative rule. She didn't assume the answer to both questions could be found slow, solely on the works of art, but rather in the predisposition of collectors and artistic institutions. I read the attempt behind this exhibition as one example out of many of her urge and commitment to take on responsibilities exceeding her gallery's duties. When she first opened her gallery, Halpert had to improvise, to invent, and to fill in the missing roles by herself. She conducted research when there was none to rely on. She acted as curator when she felt the artworks needed context or interpretation. And she pushed forward new approaches to collecting and display to museum, private collectors, and companies, while emphasizing the responsibility it should involve. Immigrant herself, her gallery roster was filled with immigrants, minorities, and other victors, victims of discrimination, whom she defended regularly amidst the great political pressure. In my five-minute presentation, I will free myself from giving specific examples, such as the one mentioned yesterday in Shipu Wong's or Jacqueline Francis' talks. After mounting a show of Jacob Lawrence's seminal series, The Migration Series, in 1941, she came to understand its importance as historical testimony and its effectiveness as a series, and worked hard to find it a significant home. In part, she succeeded. MoMA and the Phillips collection each purchased half of the series. But before of that, she hanged the series in her office for a very long period, exemplifying how one could live and should live surrounded by this powerful work. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that, which I would have shown you. Thank you very much.
And last, I'm pleased to welcome Sandra Salas. She holds a master's degree in social anthropology and ethnology from the EHESS, having also specialized in Latin American studies at the Université de la Sorbonne Nouvelle Paris Trois. Excuse my horrible accent. She has a BA in history obtained at the, the Federal University of Juiz de Fora, Brazil, and is a first-year PhD student in the history of art in the non-European art program at UNICAMP, the State University of Campinas, where her research focuses on contemporary African and African-American art. She is investigating the conception and reception of the exhibition, The, so the Short Century, Independence and Liberation Movements in Africa, 1945 to 1994, held at the Museum of, Contem Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago and at the Museum of Modern Art PS1 in 2002, and organized by Akwi A. Wenzor, excuse me, <coughs> and Wenzor, a US-based Nigerian curator. Salas has been working at the Museo Afro Brazil in Sao Paulo since 2010, developing projects and conducting research alongside the curatorial team. Please welcome Salis. Hi. Thank you, Emilia, for everything, for, for all your support. And thank you, thank you, Terra Foundation, as well. So, um, in 1994, a work from the Lynch Fragment series by the North American artist Melvin Edwards was exhibited in Brazil for the first time. It was included in the exhibition Airs of the Night, held in three Brazilian cities, Sao Paulo, Belo Horizonte, and Brasilia, under the curatorship of Emanuel Araújo, a Brazilian artist, curator, and museum director. The exhibition sought to explore different expressions of the black imaginary in Brazil, making comparisons to the art of the Caribbean and that of North America, while also highlighting similarities and continuities with respect to African art. Sculptures from the Lynch Fragment series were later exhibited in other shows, always curated by Araújo, who continued to display them among other works related to the Afro-Brazilian universe, especially in its religious dimension, accentuating the formal links between them. Presently, five works from this series are on view in the long-term exhibition at the Museu Afro Brasil in São Paulo, which is also run by Araújo. They are five small-scale welded metal reliefs displayed alongside sculptures by the Brazilian artist Ronaldo Rego and works by the North American artist George Preston and Colin Chase. Mm, the picture with, which I suggest analyzing here is from this Melvin Edwards' works on display in the museum in order to attempt to understand how this curatorial narrative establishes connections and forces readings that have been so far only briefly exploited in relation to the Lynch Fragment series. On the foreground uh, of this picture, we can see seven works by the Brazilian artist Ronaldo Rego. His art production is mostly composed of polychrome wood and iron sculptures, exploring from a personal interpretation the symbols related to the Afro-Brazilian religions, such as candomblé and umbanda. They are emblems, sculptures of tools accredited to the deities and other themes related to the sacred. In the highlighted work called Mestre Omulu, on the right, uh, made in marquetry wood and metal, the artist explores the Omulu Orisha symbolism, a Yoruba divinity from the western coast of Africa, which is related to all physical illness and their cures. On the right side of the picture, we find the work of North American artist Colin Chase. The title of the work, Colin Slut, Augustus, Augustus, sorry, and the use of metal and the tools that brought the world of manual work in these structures, alludes to the Orisha Ogun, considered by the Yoruba tradition as a war, iron, metallurgy, and technology divinity. According to this tradition, it was Ogun who taught men how to forge iron and steel into levers, axes, hoes, swords, and knives with which men can defeat nature. Finally, on the background wall, there are five pieces from the Lynch Fragment series by the artist Mav Melvin Edwards, highlighted in the upper part of this picture. A uh, series started by the artist in 1963, inspired by the racial violence and North American civil rights movement's claims 
the lynch fragments production took place over three different periods. The works, the works uh, sorry, exhibi exhibited at the Museum of Brazil are from the third phase after 1978. The names refer mainly to the artist's personal experience and to political events and celebrities of non-European European origin and in their most part African, such as the work Luanda, we remember Francisco Romão. Uh, it's the first work, uh, you can't see uh, very well, but it's the, the first work on the left in this picture, and it alludes uh, to the Angola politician who committed suicide in 2004. Um, we can't see very well, but um, set in a round, soft and compact base, there is an overlapping of several objects. Uh, in this assemblage, a hammer and an axe are tangle, are tangle. The hammer looks as if it's moving towards uh, its target, suggesting a tension of an imminent strike. An iron chain hangs from on one of the edges of the blade and it's connect is connected to the base. Two round shapes stand out. Both look as uh, they are moving, eager to detach themselves from the base in an interrupted swirl. This work, this work reveals in its singularity common aspects to four other works by Edwards which are exhibited in the museum and highlighted here, as well as other works from the series. The drama, latent and inlaid violence, the movement and imminent rupture tension, the plurality of the fami familiar shapes and objects, tools and gears, put together into a composition which causes an impact of its strangeness and the strength which transpires from it. However, all these elements and the sense suggested by its title do not rule out other interpretations. As the artist himself has already declared, he thinks of his works as icons of, or images of fertility. The fusion of elements enables multiple associations that, to a great extent, will be related to, it, to its exhibition context. At this moment, the aim of this research in progress is to investigate the way in which these works have been presented in Brazil, seeking to understand how the viewer's experience with respect to them is influenced and conditioned by their display. My argument based on interviews with the visitors and members of the museum's staff, the museum staff is that their installation at the Museum of Brazil, a museum whose collection scrutinizes, scrutinizes the African influences on Brazilian society, very focused on religions, religious aesthetics, placed lynch fragments into a new discursive context. In this context, the audience's understanding is strongly related to the iconography universe of Candomblé and Umbanda, the two Afro-Brazilian religions practiced the most in the country. Some formal aspects of the works contribute to this association. The material used by the artist and the technique Edwards himself, during a series of trips through Africa in the 70s, mentioned in several interviews the influence of aspects related to metal work from the African societies in his work and the core role of the blacksmith in the re region, highlighting that this activity belongs to the Orisha Ogun's domain. Furthermore, the objects used in his reliefs allude in an Afro-Brazilian context to the Orisha's tools. Work tools, in general, are associated to the Orisha Ogun, while the axe, in particular a tool which is also very present in lynch fragments, has its ceremonial role related to the, to the Orisha Xangô, the divinity of justice, fire and lightning, where the phallic shape of some of these tools, also within the Afro-Brazilian perspective, refers to Exu, another divinity of the Yoruba panthe pantheon, and represents the principle of continuity that is guaranteed by human sexuality and reproduction. Thus, uh, the dialogue created between the works by this display introduces another layer, layer of reference in the recognition of Edward's works. However, at the same time as its expography enhances associations and incorporates one more level of complexities in the Lynch fragments reading, it weakens or even vanishes its political potential and its uh, character of reporting the oppressed status experienced by black people in North America, which was present in the origin of the series. The reference in his works to other events, 
events uh, which relate largely to black people's experience in the United States, Cuba and Africa are also not addressed. I argue that, an, that a new way of looking at these works is required, recovering, recovering their cross-cultural reference and putting them in a wider perspective beyond the Afro-Brazilian. Thank you. going to welcome our speakers onto stage. If we can get the lights up so they don't trip. It's a little tight. <laughs> I want to thank all of our graduate student speakers for a really fantastic set of pep papers that really dialogued with some of the key themes of the conference in interesting and overlapping ways. Um, in the interest of time, I will open it up to questions, but I have a few of my own in my pocket, should anyone be hesitant to speak. We have two mics in the back. I guess, oh, here we go. <laughs> Can I be heard? Yeah. Okay, I guess it's a question for Ellie Azoulay. Um, I had a question about the, um, how Edith Halpert became so successful in the worst years of the Great Depression. Because you didn't really mention too much historical context. I wonder if that, because of the short time we had, yeah. So I wondered if you could speak to that, because that always struck me as something quite extraordinary. Um, as far as, as, I, as I've learned and studied about the Depression, uh, it's been the American Folk Art Gallery that sustained her and, and managed to uh, support both the downtown gallery and our support of the artists she's been representing at the time. So basically, um, the market of folk art had been increasingly growing and she had um, several of, uh, <coughs> of supportive collectors that's been from the Rockefellers and many other um, rich and influential private collectors and public figures that continue to buy uh, works of, of art, of folk art during the depression. And also by, of course, reducing prices, um, taking every possible technique of strategy uh, to uh, bring new clients, even in, in smaller prices. and and. The installment plan is actually not started uh, with the $13 million um, dollar exhibition and statistic. It was uh, since she opened the gallery in 1926. In the uh, first invitation to the gallery, she, she mentioned that uh, she's offering people to buy on installment plans already. So she always managed a way to, to make everything attractive for uh, people with different kind of abilities of, of purchase. I hope that answers. Can I ask our graduate students to speak into the microphones for the webcast too? Yes. In the future. <laughs> um, I was curious, and I, I wanted to ask a, a broad question as one of the framing questions for this conference, which has been, you know, what are some of the challenges or obstacles to a connected art history and, and what do you um, as emerging scholars see as some of the potentials for um, broadening our, the scope of study beyond the, na the national um, geopolitical boundaries? If anyone wants to speak to that, I'd be curious. <laughs> Too broad. <laughs> So um, I think one of the challenges I found with my project that's centered on a, on a non-national space being the sea as a space that um, different empires and nations will exert control, but it is ultimately an environmental space owned by no one particular power. 
um, is that I sense that my perspective is shifting a lot of the time. So sometimes I'm looking at America from the perspective of the British Empire. And then at other times I'm looking um, from, uh, from the colonies out to other points in a kind of Atlantic uh, or global world. Um, and so I think that, that sometimes in terms of, of discerning how those shifting perspectives can productively work together without somehow glossing over particularities and, um, and difference and not making them all, all one big thing, but, but kind of marking, uh, marking those shifts is something that I've um, thought about a lot that I find is really for me grounded in the in the actual environment of, of the space of representation that I'm studying. No? <laughs> I was also interested in listening to your talks and then over the past few days this um, I think I loved how Jennifer, Jennifer Marshall put this. She was saying we should refold the map of transnationalism in ways that can account for all its scales, macro and micro both. And I was really interested in your talks in, in terms of some of them being very focused on the idea of region while others are looking at networks. Um, and was hoping you might speak a little bit more. Um, Sandra, your, t your talk especially made me think of Ethan Lossers and how does putting these objects together, change their meaning, what's gained, what's lost, um, how does uh, local specificity matter? So I'd be interested to hear you say a bit more. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's difficult to me uh, to talk uh, deeply about that because it's uh, the beginning of the research. So um, I think uh, the, the challenge that, so uh, to uh, talk about the last question, uh, a challenge that I, I have in my research is, uh, as I am interested on uh, African-American artists, it's very difficult to, to see uh, uh, their works in Brazil. So it's very rare to, to have uh, this kind of, uh, of exhibitions of or uh, these artists are n aren't um, inv invited to our our exhibition or our museums, so it's very difficult to me. And um, it's it's difficult because uh, we have a particular uh, co uh, particular collection uh, at the museum, so uh, put this kind of uh, artworks and this um, in this uh, exhibition, it's um, it's not very it's not very easy. <laughs> like, I, I don't know how I say that better, but it's not it's not the same kind of objects. An artwork like uh, this uh, uh, Edwards works are not the same uh, objects that we have at the museum. As we said, as we, we saw, we have a lot of objects from this uh, religious context. So there are very, very diff different um, types of works. So I need to, uh, to make uh, more research about that to, to, to understand to how do it better, I think. <laughs> Sorry, very confused. Question for uh, Emily um, regarding the issue of gender and also potential reading of the domestic versus the global. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little more about what it means, maybe what Savage is trying to convey by putting Martha and Eleanor in charge of the unfurled map. You know, when, it's very noticeable that she's pointing with her fan and not with a cartographer's instrument and that young George has this blank globe, as you pointed out, whereas the, the finished map is in front of the women. And if I remember correctly, it's, she's pointing out with her fan uh, the newly laid out Pennsylvania Avenue. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit maybe about a gendered reading of that image. Um, 
That, uh, thank you, that's a, a great question. Um, the, that painting itself is, uh, I like to think of it as a aid memoir for my dissertation largely, so I'm going to take those questions and talk about them more within the project. Um, but I, I think that's really uh, thinking about the precision of the city map versus the, the vagueness of the globe. I, you know, within my reading, saw that as as this you know purely maritime globe but i think partly what you're um, pointing to is a, a tension in the early national period between um between the national and the global and and differing views about what the place of the new republic of the united states would be on a, a global stage so that um, that's something that I'm uh, wanting to explore through um, thinking about different types of work that were uh, that were owned by um, Americans that were on different sides of political divides that either were seeing a very aggressive kind of American politics abroad um, versus those that that really wanted to strike more of a of a distance between the United States um, as a as a polity and and global um, politics, um, but I think also in terms of uh, in terms of, of gender, um, my chapter where I, I talk about objects from the export trade also talks about fans that came back from China. So I think that. Um, I'm interested in objects like that because they do bring the sea into the home, um, or they they bring uh, the um, fruits of maritime trade into the home, and you know not everybody went to sea, and so part of what I'm interested in exploring is not just what people knew about the sea because they occupied that space, but what what role that space had within the American imagination. And I appreciate your comment about gender because I feel like within my project that's something I'm still thinking more about is how to, um, how to feel out what some of the, the gender divisions are, particularly since research that has been done on maritime history, it is a very masculine space traditionally in terms of, of sailors and, and those who are going to sea. So thank you. We have our first online question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Amy Torbert asked, um, what are the most significant challenges that you face in researching American topics outside America, or in Emily's case, working on British American topic from a home base in the US? How did this access, or lack thereof, shape the projects you developed? I think yeah, that was yeah. for everybody. I didn't hear the beginning yeah, of the yeah, question. Can, can you, you please repeat, repeat the beginning again? Yes, I can. So. Lots of stuff. We're okay. still quite shocked. What are the most significant challenges that you face in researching American topics outside of America, or in Emily's case, a sometimes American project in America? How did this access or lack thereof shape the projects you developed? say that uh, living in France it was really hard to research Edith Halpert. Um, there's not many material about her. Um, I was lucky to have the Archive of American Art here, uh, accessible and digitized. Um, but I can say that knowing that her influence to open a gallery uh, was originated in Paris in a trip for one year to Paris with her husband uh, Sam Hal Samuel Halpert was very um, significant for me as also a point of departure and understanding um, the historical context that she uh, encountered in her visit uh, prior to opening her gallery. So I've been looking at that period of, and starting speculating about what she might have seen and that pushed her back to, the, to New York in opening 
not only a contemporary art gallery or modern, I don't know how you want to refer it from now, but, but also to do a, like an American art gallery. Um, and what does that mean? Because she was in Paris and she felt there's, n there's no such thing in America. So she, she had to go outside in order to come back to New York. So I felt I did the reverse thing. Perhaps I can add, um, in my case, um, all the information on uh, Toby's picture uh, is to be found in the scholarship on Emily Carr. There's no um, whatsoever uh, information on the side of Mark Toby's reception because he gets important from 1930 onwards. Recently there was this exhibition on Mythic Northwest Coast School and all his contemporaries in the 1930s all men, by the way, um, but all the all uh, the information I could only found on the um, on the Canadian side. Uh, also, it was uh, um, the, the the director of the National Gallery in the 1950s uh, who um, took. Um, who, uh, there's a correspondence with Toby where this citation comes from, where he said, "If it wasn't for me, there would be no Emily Carr." So there was also the drive from the Canadian side to know what was the influence of Mark Toby on Emily Carr. So that was an interesting remark to do in my case. Um, and uh, perhaps if I can add uh, that um, um, in my case, uh, the FSA file I do, um, has been um, entirely digitized in the 19th, uh, 90s, uh, 90. And, uh, but I had to come in Washington for um, for working on microfilm, Vandalbis microfilm, and um, um, the the new um, information technology, so the online catalog of the Library of Congress, completely discarded uh, the Vandalbis edited microfilm because uh, they considered it as a, an uh, older maybe or. Um, Yes, an, an older technology which uh, um, doesn't uh, doesn't um, I don't know. But <laughs> what I want to say is that in, um, I I think that um, for Vanderbilt, uh, microfilm as information technologies was not only um, a mean uh, for uh, communicating information, but also uh, a tool for. Um, editing for uh, curating the information that were, um, he was working on it. The Im images, the collection uh, you know, uh, that he was um, uh, working with. And uh, um, I was wondering if, uh, if uh, with this um, new technology, new digitizing project doesn't have to um, acknowledge the work that uh, has been already done on the same collection when they have, uh, when they propose um, new um, digitizing project. I know, I don't, I'm not sure. So far. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to think about your question of, of how do the visual strategies of preserving and presenting these images, um, how do they shape art history or visual culture understanding? And, and now we're in this time where the Smithsonian and every institution is, is coming up with their digitization priorities. Do they do it by theme? Do they do it by popularity? Do they do it on demand? And how will that affect future scholarship? It's, it's really a fascinating yes. question. Yes, the, the microfilm um, uh, microfilm stories, as um, Vanderbilt called, uh, it, this is uh, this, uh, a series of photographs that he um, selected and reorganized into a series, liner sequences, um, uh, had a special meaning for uh, Vanderbilt as an uh, archivist, uh, as a curator of the FSA file, but uh, um, now uh, and, uh, they are completely uh, invisible for, um, uh, the, for, the, for users that uh, uh, approach the FSA file via information technology. And that, uh, yes. Hi. Um, thank you all for your wonderful presentations. Um, and thanks for doing a great job in what, for many of you, is a second language. Um, I, having grown up in Montreal as an Anglo, I, I really appreciate that. Hello. 
Um, and I have a, a comment and a question. So my comment, um, Emily, as uh, when Graham brought his question up about gender, I was thinking about the masculine gender of all the items you're talking about, but then I was also thinking about shell workhouses in the 18th century, um, especially in England. I don't know of any extant examples in the United States, but that seems to me to be a way that elite women, especially, um, were really dealing with the maritime. Uh, so I'd love to see what you would make of that in your project. Um, so that's my comment part. And then my, my question um, is, is for Elizabeth. Um, it, the, the Toby painting that you show um, bears a remarkable sim similarity to a really iconic American 19th century painting, which I'm not sure you're familiar with. You might be. But um, Charles Bird's King, Vanity of the Artist's Dream. No? Oh, yeah. Oh, what, yes. Say that again, please. Uh, Charles Bird King's Vanity of the Artist's Dream. Yeah. 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 So um, that really seems like a modernist reworking of a 19th century uh, classic of, um, of American artistic anxiety. And he's doing it with this Canadian artist. Um, so I wondered what is going on there. And if you could <laughs> address that. I mean, that's a. That's a very good hypothesis. I mean, I've I tried to, in this five minute talk, I tried to uh, explain a little bit the uh, Emily Carr situations. And as I, I said, like her dream and her vision started very early, like from 1907, she had this project, but first she didn't have the, the artistic tools, like her, um, her, her stylistic, um, uh, she, she had to go to Paris before to find really the, the way of expression, how to pursue her artistic project to paint all the totem poles. But uh, as she had this very unfortunate, uh, like the First World War came and she could not really um, um, have success with her artistic project, so she stopped she stopped this career and during this time I said she didn't paint at all, that's not true. There we have a, a self-portrait where we see her from behind uh, in front of a, a blank canvas. So um, as she d could not pursue this ethno-artistic project, she had no project at all, so she stopped rather painting. But then in the 1920s when she met through an anthropological connection, that's very interesting, an anthropological connection between Victoria and Seattle and through that uh, artist from Seattle who had been also in Europe, she, she had her vision and her dream re revived. And in this time she exhibits again in Seattle and a Seattle artist come to her place and realize that there is a, a true uh, modernist there uh, as, a, as running a boarding house. Uh, but uh, so, and in this, I think I can imagine that when Mark Toby came uh, in 1928, uh, when she came back from the East very recently and she had uh, picked up her project and had finally success at the age of 57. So I think that is perhaps a reflection on, uh, on her situation and being in her studio that, that uh, must have bear witness to uh, a career like this bust from the 19th century, um, she, like her her bust and her collection of native artifacts and the, t the painting that must have piled up in her studio because she didn't sell anything uh, before uh, the 1920s. So I think that's a very, that would be a nice uh, reflection on, uh, and on this comparison between this 19th century painting that makes totally sense. So very, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I also have a question for um, Elizabeth. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I'm over here. Oh, you're over here. Hi. <laughs> um, it seemed for a while after the 1984 MoMA show that the framework of primitivism was beyond rescue, right? It underwent True. this very serious period of, of critique for so many reasons. Um, but I was reminded a couple of times in your talk of Ruth Phillips' recent reformulation of primitivism as a portal mm. through which um, uh, 
a variety of actors, white and indigenous, um, were able to form relationships, um, articulate a range of interests, both aesthetic and political, historically. And then it seems like that notion of primitivism as a portal underlies many of the multiple modernisms initiatives that have been happening since the 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering, you know, you've, you framed the, the five minute presentation in terms of the relationship between Toby and Carr, but I also wondered whether those two figures um, could be situated within uh, something more like a network um, that includes indigenous artists as well. I mean, you kind of hinted at that, and I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that vis-a-vis um, -vis the shifting terrain of modernism with the kind of addition of the S lately. I mean, I mean, thank you very much for your question. I mean, in my case, um, both artists are informed by the canonical primitivism of European avant-garde. Um, that is also what I call like uh, shared artistic sensibilities. So they they knew this uh, Picasso and Matisse uh, primitivism around 1910, and then coming back home. So it'll be another talk about uh, about the notion of home and and. But coming back to their own region and and being and encountering like um, traditions and cultures and artifacts that ask for another primitivism, uh, that is like double informed on a formalist way by European avant-garde practices, but then doubled and twice by the the, the immediate encounter with the artifact in the case of Emily Carr traveling to the native sites and, and meeting First Nations um, people over there, but being like convinced in her contemporary belief that this is a, a, a culture to be distinct, to, to, uh, to, to feel the need, the urge of her uh, region to p paint them before they would be gone. So that is a, a, a double, double layered primitivism. And um, Emily Carr knew of um, First Nations artisans. I mean, there is this, this tradition of this basketry, stylish bas basketry. She knew of this tradition. And um, when I, I mentioned it, but uh, Emily Carr was very well aware that in the time period where she didn't paint, but she did pottery in what she called Indian design, was of course an appropriation of this uh, region's um, visual um, tradition. So it's not as it's not easy as you. <laughs> there are different layers of primitivism, and you can't. It's not a, what I, my point. What I want to make is not an import of a modernist formalist style called primitivism, and it had been kind of, uh, like you said, discarded in, in art history, but really to look at, um, at modes of primitivism that really respond to, to local conditions and how that changed, couldn't really elaborate on that, but how that changed really affected or in an effectively way their practices of artists, but these artists that had been informed by modernist painting, that is my, my point, my, where I'm I think we'll from. take one more question. Um, for Ellie Azoulay, I wondered to what extent you could address Halpert's business background and so that, you know, handing out surveys and stuff in a gallery is right out of working in a department store on business efficiency, right, and marketing. So I don't know what the politics exactly are then of that and when someone said how did she, you know, uh, open her gallery and keep it running dur during the depression, she was rich. And she was rich not because she was a rich woman, but because she made money from, you know, Jewish business, basically, in turn of the century New York. And that's not that usual for the woman to be the one who makes all that money doing business unless it's a family business, or whatever. So what about that is in your project? And also, how then are you planning to, because I felt there was a political dimension to how you saw her, but I would say her her life is very in the mainstream of American capitalism. Uh, so you raised many, you've raised many, um, many different points. Um, one thing about her biography, she did work in marketing, in advertising at the beginning. Now that you said it, she might be working also in a department store, I think, but I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just fantasizing a little bit. <laughs> 
um, but she did come from a, like a, this kind of a marketing and advertising background, which really helped her. And and also she, she come from from a not wealthy background, but a background of an immigrant that came with nothing, basically not much to the U.S. And and she was. Uh, um, she was maintaining her family, her mother and sister, while working all the time. So she, she earned it from scratch. Um, and another thing you asked about was the political dimension. Uh, I'm really interested in that. Um, it's really hard to tackle. Uh, there's much to learn and study before, but it's this tension you were talking about, like in, in the one hand, kind of political aspect, but on the other hand, like working from within the mainstream America is really true in her case. Uh, many people talked here about the Cold War and about the, um, the exhibition in Moscow. So she, she curated an exhibition in Moscow as part of these efforts. But on the other hand, and, and her, her major goal was to, to create an American art, an American gallery. Um, to everyone coming from all different backgrounds, but but the American is the goal. So she's kind of uh, fulfilling the American dream within the art context, and also, um, but but she was still aware to some problem problems. Like for example, once the WPA uh, was dismantled, or after they've been canceling, they uh, the Congress canceled a huge uh, purchase of artworks for like having a. A national collection with many gal uh, many artists from a gallery. She uh, resented that, and she took part in a demonstration, protestation uh, against this movement and against the attack that of the time uh, of uh, contemporary art abstraction, the, the, the older abstraction, not abstraction uh, that came after. But most more of her artists, like Stuart Davis and other, um, and. And she did an amazing speech at that time um, while she um, confronted the congressmen and politicians and businessmen talking about contemporary art and abstract art as if it was of the devil and the communist and all the racism of the time. And she um, confronted that with, uh, with uh, Adolf Hitler um, uh, speech or ideology of degenerate art. So she was also critically uh, critical in her approach, but only in as less result. Like she preferred to keep it down and 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 to hope for better uh, future. But for example, in the case of uh, uh, maybe I'm not pronouncing the name right, uh, Yasu Kuniyashi, um, she was she was fighting a lot to give it to um, to try to get a, a citizenship for him once the the war with Japan was declared and he completely got. Uh, undressed from all his uh, rights to live in America and uh, and was a victim for many attacks so she she did fought for each one for, I hope for m most of our artists uh, in various occasions but um, still with believing in this American dream of everyone can be here and it's an immigrant and we just need to be the best, and we need to show the Russians how we do it the best, and how American art is the best. And so it was always this duality, like not acknowledging the the real that the r r racism and the, um, and the corruption and the attacks and all of that are part of the system. So she didn't do this. Uh, that's it. I hope I I want to thank all of our speakers for a really excellent presentation. We have 20 minutes for coffee upstairs in the courtyard. Please join us back here at 315. Thank you.